Thank you for joining our briefing on the city of Philadelphia's response to COVID-19. Today, we're joined by Dr. William Height, the superintendent of the Philadelphia School District. And all of our speakers are joining a briefing that is virtually to adhere to social distancing. We will begin our briefing today with opening remarks from your mayor. You have the floor. Thanks, Mike. Good afternoon. <coughs> Today we're we'll joined by Dr. William Height, superintendent of the school district. Throughout this pandemic, Dr. Height and his leadership, as well as hundreds of staff, principals, and teachers, have been working hard to determine how to educate our children despite COVID-19. Height has a district survey about how they can safely reopen. In addition, he has an important announcement about town hall that will allow members of the public to weigh in directly. With all that feedback in hand, I am confident that the district. We'll announce a reopening plan later th later this month that will go for go far toward meeting the educational needs of our children in the midst of these very difficult circumstances. I want to thank all those who took part in the survey and those who got involved in the town halls. If you are looking for what we what you can do to help, here is a simple ask: Please wear a mask. The sooner the threat of this, this virus is gone, the sooner our children can be back in the classroom 100% of the time. And so for the sake of our kids and for all of us, we need those masks worn. We need our kids in school and we need this virus wiped out. Everyone can do their part by wearing the mask. And with that, I turn things over to Dr. Height. Thanks, Mayor Kenny, and good afternoon, everyone. And as the mayor indicated, I wanna first begin by thanking all of the staff members, teachers, administrators, central office staff for creating and working hard, very hard to create a lot of information that will be considered as we begin making plans to come back to school. As the mayor indicated earlier last week, the school district of Philadelphia shared results of our reopening survey of which more than 36,000 parent and guardians, community members, staff and students completed. Some of the key findings from the survey, which was open from June 15th through June 22nd, found that the top three safety measures respondents believe will help with the development of safe and effective reopening plan were mask wearing 30, some 30%, daily building cleaning 14% and hand washing sanitizing stations, another 14%. Additionally, the survey found that 47% of approximately 15,000 parents and guardians who completed the survey said they would send their children back to school under current circumstances, and 62% said they would send their children back with safety measures in place. 28% of the 12,334 school-based staff and 27% of parents and guardians said they would feel most comfortable if students returned to school in shifts on alternate days of the week. Another 24% of school-based staff and 21% of parents and guardians said they would prefer students attend school daily, but in shifts. We're pleased with this level of engagement and still providing opportunities for our stakeholders to share their thoughts and feelings about what a return to school might look like. This morning, we kicked off, as Mayor Kenny indicated, a series of virtual town halls. There are five sessions offering the public an opportunity to get updates on our planning efforts for the 2020-2021 school year, and importantly, to provide additional feedback to inform final planning and decision-making. Led by our subject matter experts in the areas of health and safety, academic supports, school operations, and facilities management, these sessions will allow participants to learn more about our thinking on supporting health and safety in our schools as offices, cleaning as schools and offices, cleaning practices and protocols, instructional design and digital learning plan and school scheduling and much, much more. In addition to the feedback we receive from our stakeholders, whether through this virtual town hall series or via the feedback form that can be found by visiting www.philasd.org slash 2020 school start we will use the guidance and best practices recommended by public health experts, such as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Philadelphia Department of Public Health, and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to inform a plan 
for the upcoming school year that will support safe and healthy learning and work environments for every student and staff member. Our goal is to share a final plan next week in order to allow our staff and families to prepare for the start of a successful school year in the coming weeks. Again, we encourage everyone to visit www.philasd.org slash 2020 school start for updates and an opportunity to provide feedback. I want to thank the mayor and his team once again for providing us with this opportunity to share these updates. Thank, thanks again, Mayor Kenny. And thank you, Dr. Height. Now we will go to uh, the health commissioner, Dr. Thomas. Good afternoon. Uh, case counts from the coronavirus continue to rise nationally and in Pennsylvania as a whole. Here in Philadelphia, our daily case counts in the past week have been stable, neither rising nor falling. Uh, so here are the numbers with the background. Uh, in cases since yesterday, we've identified uh, our new 91 cases, bringing us to a total of 26,901 since the beginning of the epidemic here in Philadelphia. Now, in the past week, we've averaged just a little more than 110 cases per day. Uh, that's the week that ended last Saturday, which is no significant change from the week before that. There have been changes, however, in the age group of people who have been uh, infected. In the last four weeks, our cases are rising in people under the age of 40, are pretty much stable in people between the ages of 40 and 49 and are falling in people over the age of 50. Now, people over 50 are the ones who are most likely to be severely ill, so it's good that the case counts in that age group are decreasing, uh, but we're still concerned that the younger people who may not themselves get severely ill uh, can pass it on to older people, so we're gonna need to watch uh, the age range of people getting infected in the future closely. Since this time yesterday, we've identified zero new deaths from the coronavirus, uh, our total since the beginning of the epidemic is 1,617, uh, of which 832 or 51% are in nursing home residents. Now, so far the last week, the week that ended last Saturday, there were only four deaths that we identified uh, and 16 the week before. Uh, it's great to see those numbers as low as they are. Uh, there is a delay in reporting, so we do expect those numbers to rise a little bit. To put that in perspective, at the peak of the epidemic in mid-April, in one week we had 246 deaths. Uh, so no death is acceptable. No t every death is a tragedy. The fact that we're getting closer to zero is a sign that we've made really a lot of progress so far in the epidemic. Now, other areas of the country are continuing to see very rapid growth of the epidemic. Uh, U.S. case counts are continuing to hit all-time highs, particularly severe in Florida and Arizona and Texas. In some cases, their daily case rates on a per capita basis are higher than they were in New York City at the peak of the epidemic in New York City. These are places that opened without enforcing safety precautions like masks, uh, and I think they're paying the price for that. We're also seeing rapid growth in southwest Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh area. In Allegheny County, they're now reporting more than 150 cases per day. That's up from about 20 cases per day two weeks ago. In every region of Pennsylvania, it's showing increases. We're also seeing rapid growth of the epidemic in Delaware, uh, which has really seen nearly a doubling of their case rates in the past week. Now we're not seeing that rapid increase here in Philadelphia yet. Uh, we wanna keep it that way. Uh, that's why we responded as we have, to try to prevent a second wave here. The things we're doing, just to remind you, include reminding businesses and activity managers of their responsibility to enforce everybody keeping a distance and even more so enforce everybody wearing masks. We can't be there, but other people are there who can enforce that. Uh, we do have an executive order requiring masks and the governor has an executive order requiring masks. Uh, we will be launching a media campaign reminding everybody of the importance of masks uh, on this Thursday. On Thursday, you'll learn more about that media campaign. We have put on pause the reopening of restaurants and bars to indoor dining here in Philadelphia. We are recommending that everyone who can work remotely continue to do so. Uh, and I would recommend that people avoid social events and going to restaurants and bars outside of Philadelphia where they're open for indoor dining. These are places where people are close together and they're not wearing masks. And to the extent that we can understand how this virus is being spread in other areas around us, that appears to be the case. It's these social events uh, in restaurants and bars. Now, we know that we're not going to totally be able to eliminate this virus, and so we want to protect those people who are at most risk for severe infection. And so we are recommending that people who are medically vulnerable take extra precautions. Uh, and the basic idea here is stay home and try not to let COVID into the house. That means that other people who are in your household should also stay home as much as possible. Uh, and that when you're around those household members who are leaving the house, wear a mask and ask other people to do that as well. 
more information on everything I've discussed here, as well as our statistics, uh, is at www.phila.gov slash COVID. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Farley. Now Armando will provide the Spanish language translations of uh, the mayors, Dr. Heights, and Dr. Farley's comments. Palabras del alcalde Jim Kenny para hoy, martes 7 de julio del 2020. Buenas tardes. Hoy nos complace contar con la presencia del Dr. William Height, superintendente del Distrito Escolar de Filadelfia. Durante la pandemia, el Dr. Height y su equipo, así como cientos de directores, maestros y el personal del distrito, han estado trabajando arduamente buscando formas de educar mejor a nuestros niños dada la pandemia del COVID-19. El Dr. Height tiene los resultados de una encuesta que realizó el Distrito Escolar de Filadelfia sobre su reapertura segura este otoño. Además, él hará un anuncio importante sobre algunas reuniones virtuales en las que el público podrá participar para aclarar sus dudas. Estoy seguro de que a finales de este mes, el Distrito Escolar anunciará un plan de reapertura que satisfaga las necesidades educativas de nuestros niños en medio de estas difíciles circunstancias. Quiero agradecerles a todos los que participaron en la encuesta y a quienes están trabajando tanto para hacer posibles los ayuntamientos virtuales. Si usted está buscando qué puede hacer para ayudar, aquí le sugiero algo muy sencillo. Use una máscara. Mientras más pronto desaparezca la amenaza de este virus, nuestros hijos podrán regresar a las aulas más rápidamente. Por el bien de nuestros niños, es necesario usar las máscaras, porque los necesitamos en la escuela y porque para lograrlo tenemos que reducir el riesgo que representa este virus, use una máscara. Todos podemos hacer nuestra parte. Use su máscara al salir de casa. Y esta es la actualización en materia de salud para el martes 7 de julio de 2020. Los casos continúan aumentando a nivel nacional y también en Pensilvania. En Filadelfia, el reporte de casos se encuentra estable desde la semana pasada. Se han reportado 91 nuevos casos, con un total de 26.901 casos acumulados actualmente. En promedio, hemos tenido 110 casos diarios durante la última semana. En las últimas cuatro semanas, los casos aumentaron en personas menores de 40 años, se estabilizaron en las personas entre los 19 y 40 años de edad y disminuyeron entre los mayores de 50 años. Los menores de 40 años de edad que contraen este virus normalmente no se enferman gravemente, pero los jóvenes sí les transmiten el virus a los mayores. Hoy, felizmente, no reportamos fallecimientos. El total acumulado de muertes por la COVID-19 es de 1,617. 832 de estas muertes, o el 51%, ha sido en hogares de ancianos. Hay un retraso en el reporte de las muertes, pero podemos adelantar que la semana pasada hubo cuatro fallecimientos por la COVID-19 en comparación con los 16 fallecimientos la semana anterior. Y esto en contraste con los 246 fallecimientos a mediados de abril en una semana. En todos lados, las señales demuestran que la epidemia está empeorando. En los Estados Unidos, los casos se están incrementando rápidamente, particularmente en la Florida, Arizona y Texas. En algunos lugares, el número diario de casos es mayor al que los casos que se reportaban en Nueva York durante el pico de la epidemia. Lamentablemente, el número de casos va aumentando en las regiones del suroeste de Pensilvania. El condado de Allegheny pasó de reportar 20 casos por día hace dos semanas a 150 casos diarios ahora. Cada región de Pensilvania está reportando un repunte de los casos. Ha habido también un crecimiento muy rápido en Delaware, que casi duplicó el total que se había reportado la semana pasada. En Filadelfia no hemos visto un rápido aumento de los casos todavía. Nuestra respuesta a la segunda ola de la epidemia ya la conocen, pero aprovecho la oportunidad para explicarla una vez más. Tenemos que recordarle insistentemente a los negocios, sus gerentes y supervisores que deben hacer cumplir con el uso de la máscara o cubierta facial en sus establecimientos. Hemos emitido una orden municipal que norma el uso obligatorio de máscaras en espacios abiertos y bajo techo. Estamos desplegando una campaña informativa sobre el uso de estas máscaras y esta campaña se lanzará este jueves 9 de julio. Hemos suspendido el reinicio del servicio completo de restaurantes en sus interiores y el funcionamiento de los gimnasios. Les recomendamos evitar los eventos sociales y el visitar bares y restaurantes fuera de la ciudad. Lamentablemente, muchos ahí no usan máscaras y no cumplen con las pautas del distanciamiento social. 
les recomendamos a todas las personas que puedan trabajar remotamente que continúen haciéndolo. Les recomendamos a las poblaciones vulnerables, a los mayores de 65 años o a los que tengan condiciones médicas preexistentes a tomar precauciones adicionales. No deje que el COVID entre en su casa, por favor. Permanezca en su hogar. No salga a la calle para hacer diligencias no esenciales. Los familiares que vivan con estas personas deben estar en casa el mayor tiempo posible. Use una máscara e insista que sus familiares y quienes cuidan de usted usen máscaras cuando no puedan mantener la distancia social en el hogar. Estaremos viviendo con este virus por un largo tiempo, pero no será para siempre. Eso esperamos. Y recordamos que solo con nuestro esfuerzo conjunto podremos superar esta crisis. Y estas son las palabras del doctor William Hyde, superintendente del Distrito Escolar de Filadelfia. La semana pasada, el Distrito Escolar de Filadelfia compartió los resultados de su sondeo respecto a la reapertura de clases, con participación de más de 36 mil padres, tutores, miembros de la comunidad, personal y estudiantes. Algunos de los hallazgos clave de la encuesta, que estuvo abierta del 15 de junio al 22 de junio, fueron las siguientes. Las tres principales medidas de seguridad que los encuestados creen que ayudarán con el desarrollo de un plan de reapertura seguro y efectivo fueron el uso de las máscaras, 30%, la limpieza diaria de edificios, 14%, y las estaciones de lavado de manos, 14%. Además, la encuesta encontró que el 47% de los aproximadamente 15.000 padres y tutores que respondieron dijeron que ellos enviarían a sus hijos de vuelta a la escuela bajo las circunstancias actuales y el 62% dijeron que enviarían a sus hijos de regreso con medidas de seguridad establecidas. El 28% del personal escolar, es decir, 12,334 personas, y el 27% de los padres y tutores dijeron que se sentirían más seguros si los estudiantes regresaran a la escuela por turnos en diferentes días de la semana. El 24% del personal escolar y el 21% de los padres y tutores dijeron que preferirían que los estudiantes asistan a la escuela todos los días, pero por turnos. Estamos muy satisfechos con este nivel de compromiso y todavía estamos brindando oportunidades para que todos los interesados compartan sus ideas y opiniones sobre cómo sería un regreso ideal a la escuela. Esta mañana iniciamos una serie de ayuntamientos virtuales. Hay cinco sesiones que ofrecen al público en general la oportunidad de recibir actualizaciones sobre nuestros esfuerzos de planificación para el año escolar 2020-2021 y lo que es más importante, para aportar comentarios adicionales para informar la planificación final y la toma de decisiones. Estas sesiones son dirigidas por nuestros expertos en las áreas de salud y seguridad, apoyo académico, operaciones escolares y la administración de instalaciones. El objetivo de estas sesiones es brindarle a los participantes herramientas para aprender más sobre las medidas que estamos tomando para garantizar la salud y seguridad en nuestras escuelas y oficinas, nuestros protocolos de limpieza, de diseño instruccional, planes de aprendizaje digital, programación escolar y más. Sus comentarios son muy importantes. Puede usted compartirlos a través del formulario de comentarios que puede encontrar visitando www.filasd.org barra diagonal 2020 School Start. Nosotros utilizaremos la orientación y las mejores prácticas recomendadas por los expertos en salud pública los Centros para el Control de Prevención de Enfermedades, el Departamento de Salud Pública de Filadelfia y el Hospital de Niños de Filadelfia para elaborar un plan para el próximo año escolar que respalde el aprendizaje saludable y los entornos de trabajo seguros para cada estudiante y miembros de nuestro personal. Nuestro objetivo es compartir la próxima semana un plan final para permitir que nuestro personal y nuestras familias se preparen para el comienzo de un nuevo año escolar exitoso. Nuevamente, les invitamos a todos a visitar www.filasd.org barra diagonal 2020 School Start para obtener actualizaciones y para brindar sus valiosos comentarios. Muchas gracias. Very good. Thank you, Armando. Now we will uh, move to the Q&A portion for members of the media. A reminder that the school superintendent, Dr. William Height, is staying on in case you have questions to the school district. Please limit your questions to topics related 
to the COVID-19 pandemic. And if time permits, we will open the floor later to other topics. If your hand is raised right now on a different topic, please lower it and we will try to get to you later. Please remember, of course, we have limited time. So only one representative from each media outlet is permitted to ask questions and reporters are asked to limit their questions to three or fewer. As I said, we will do a second round of questions on other topics if time permits. For now, we will start off with Mitch Blocker of NBC10. Good afternoon, everybody. Dr. Farley, uh, can you talk a little bit about your level of comfort with kids returning to school by taking the bus, by um, limiting the numbers in classrooms? What, what is your comfort level on the kinds of things that we normally would think of with a return to school? Well, you know, we know in general that children are less likely to become ill with this infection. Um, it's a little less clear the likelihood to spread it to others. Uh, and so we're probably uh, there's less concern there would be with children and uh, getting together than with adults getting together. Uh, nonetheless, uh, in any place where we have children getting together, we're going to have to put in place a variety of um, safety precautions. And uh, we are working with the school district around safety precautions in the classroom, in buses and other settings. Uh, we don't have all that information. They haven't presented their plan yet, uh, but I can tell you that, that their plan will be there to try to uh, make the risk be as small as possible. It will never be zero risk, but we will try to minimize that risk. Um, I'd, lo I'd love your thoughts uh, and Dr. Heights' thoughts on, on this. Um, first, Dr. Farley, you've said teenagers are driving the, the new spike in cases. Does grade or age make a difference when it comes to you deciding who returns to school and how often they might be able to attend in-person class? I'll take that. So the um, we are prioritizing and we're prioritizing first by our most vulnerable children and then by the children who uh, who really need to be in front of a teacher. And so th those two groups then equal many of the children with special needs who throughout the time that we were remote, did not have face-to-face -face learning. Many of the children who are English language learners who did not have face-to-face -face instruction and some of our youngest children, like children in pre-K, kindergarten and first grade. Those are the children that we're prioritizing to be in front of individuals. And then we're setting other plans for essentially everyone else. And, and, and but those are categories of children that we would want to see on a more regular basis, if not every day. Um, I'll add one group to that category, and those are children in career and technical education courses, um, because they have training components with materials that they can only get in person. Uh, and one more question for you, sir. Um, what, can you talk a little bit about what teachers are telling you in terms of their comfort level? In returning to class, um, you know, we we talked a little bit about uh, adults versus versus children. Um, I don't know what the average age of the of a school teacher is or a, an adult in the Philadelphia school district, but what what are they telling you in terms of their comfort? Yeah, so we had um, survey responses from many of our teachers that were very consistent with the survey responses from uh, a survey that was sent out from the PFT. Um, and where the vast majority of those individuals want to make sure that uh, the, the sanitation protocols are in place at schools, that masks are required, um, and then there are, there are strict protocols for social distancing. Uh, but the, the, the vast majority of them also want to make sure that we are returning in a way that's safe for children ensuring that there are options for those who are in vulnerable categories. Thank you, gentlemen. Dr. Farley, was there anything you wanted to add to, uh, to any of that? Oh, no, that's fine. Very good. All right, and thank you, Mitch. We'll move on now to Yaima Crespo of Telemundo. Hola, muy buenas tardes. Eh, mi pregunta es para el doctor Farley. El gobernador de Nueva Jersey alertó una alza en los contagios de coronavirus. Él dijo que era una señal temprana de alerta. ¿Qué medidas estará tomando la ciudad para que esta situación no se repita aquí? Eh, Yaima, ¿puedes repetirme un poquito qué fue lo que dijo el gobernador de New Jersey? Eh, que hay una alerta, una alertó sobre una alza en los contagios de coronavirus en el estado. Ok, gracias. ¿Y qué medidas está tomando la ciudad para impedir lo mismo, verdad? Claro. Uh -huh. Sí. The question is for Farley, Dr. Farley. The governor of New Jersey has uh, let us know that there has been an upgrade, uptake 
of uh, infections in his state and there's been an alert for it. What is the city thinking to do? What measures would be in place to prevent such a, uh, an increase in the city? I'm sorry, I, I missed part of the questions there. Could you say that one more time, Armando? Yes, uh, the New Jersey governor has made an announcement and an alert about the increase of infections in his state. Okay. What is the city thinking to do? What measures would be in place to avoid such an increase in the city? And so there are increases not only in New Jersey, but in the rest of Pennsylvania and in Delaware. So all around us, we are seeing increase, increases in cases. Uh, I did lay out the steps that we are putting in place here to try to prevent those same increases from happening in Philadelphia, including enforcing mask use, uh, including a media campaign that encourages mask use, including not allowing restaurants and bars to open up for indoor dining. Um, and um, I forget the other things I mentioned there, but they're, the, uh, those are the key steps. Eh, obviamente ha habido un incremento de los casos, no solamente en New Jersey, pero también en el resto de Pensilvania y en el estado de Delaware. Y nosotros hemos tomado ciertos pasos para evitar este aumento de los casos y para impedirlo. Y estos son algunas de las medidas que estamos desplegando, que es el uso de las máscaras obligatoriamente, una campaña en los medios para poder educar a la gente para lograr que se cumpla con el uso de estas normas incluye el impedir el servicio en los restaurantes y en bares, en locales cerrados. Y obviamente vamos a continuar nosotros tratando de educar a la gente a que cumpla con estas normas. Estos son algunos de los elementos claves. Uh -huh. Y también para el, para el doctor Farley, eh, ¿se consideraría entonces eh, poner en cuarentena viajeros de, por ejemplo, Nueva Jersey y el estado de Delaware? Doctor Farley, this question is for you as well. Would you consider putting uh, on quarantine, uh, the travelers coming from New Jersey or Delaware as well? We have made recommendations that people who have traveled from a high incidence area uh, self-quarantine for 14 days. Uh, and we define that as more uh, with a numeric cutoff that includes many states in the South. At this moment, it actually does include Delaware because of their increased case rates. It does not include New Jersey. Nosotros estamos solamente emitiendo recomendaciones para que los individuos que vienen de lugares donde ha habido un incremento en el número de casos se auto, eh, estén en cuarentena voluntaria por 14 días y eso incluye a los estados del sur, incluye obviamente eh, a los estados donde ha habido este problema, pero todavía no incluye a Nueva Jersey, aunque incluye a Delaware. Y por último, um, según el Departamento de Salud, la mayoría de los casos positivos de coronavirus están ocurriendo en lugares de alta población hispana como Mayfair y Torsdale. Eh, los latinos son una población bastante vulnerable. Eh, ¿A qué atribuyen estos resultados y qué medidas se están tomando en la comunidad? The Health Department has issued some reports indicating that uh, increase in the cases is occurring in heavily populated Latino communities, such as those in Mayfair and Torsdale. And we see that the Latino community is particularly vulnerable in this case. What are, are your thoughts on it and what measures are to impede this, to prevent this? So we have seen higher case rates um, in Latinos, higher case rates in African-Americans and in whites. Um, this has to do with uh, you know, uh, longstanding disadvantage of those populations. Um, and uh, And so we are, making efforts to communicate to people about their risk. Uh, we are particularly around the section of workers. We're making efforts to increase testing availability in um, populations that are underserved. Um, and, but it boils down to really uh, encouraging people to use masks um, and, uh, and keep their distance from people. Um, and we are gonna just continue to try to get that message out. Nosotros hemos visto un incremento en los casos entre las comunidades en, de latinos y de afroamericanos en comparación con las comunidades blancas. Y esto se debe en parte a distintas eh, maneras de poder acceder a los servicios médicos que tienen mucho tiempo ya atrás. Nosotros vemos de que podemos intentar de difundir las medidas para reducir los riesgos en las áreas de trabajo, obviamente tratando de expandir las pruebas para que estén disponibles en estas comunidades que no han tenido acceso a cuidado médico de forma regular y vamos a continuar con nuestro mensaje de utilizar las mascarillas y mantener la distancia social por ahora. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Yaima. Thank you, Armando. And now let's go on to Jeff Cole of Fox 29. Yeah, hi there. Uh, questions for uh, Dr. Hyde. Dr. Hyde, uh, as we know, in the city of Philadelphia, many of your students go to school 
uh, in very old buildings, some 100 years old, aging buildings, some with asbestos that we know you've been trying to remediate. Dr. Height, are these aging buildings even adequate in terms of ventilation and other ills to re other issues to return children to school this fall? Yeah, it's just one thing that we are analyzing as part of our plan, Jeff, and particularly with many of our older buildings, while we're doing some work on the environmental issues, we're also looking at what will be needed in buildings to actually create ventilation that would be considered adequate. And in some cases that may be fans, in other cases it may be air conditioned, if in fact there is the electric, electricity there. Um, and if it doesn't have the right ventilation, then we would have to take those areas or rooms or in some cases schools offline. Wow. Do you have any sense of which ones or how many and how that impacts your plan at this point? Yeah, no, it's one of the it's one of the dependencies that we have to focus on as a part of the recommendations that we're making. And once we have that information, it's going to inform the final plan. Um, and which means that some schools could be open, but there are areas of the building that may not be usable. Um, and so we, we will be working through that process as we continue to work through the plan that we're going to deliver next week. You had said that uh, earlier on, you've said that uh, the lockdown, the problem with obviously city tax revenue has blown obviously a hole in your budget as well. Um, you're going to uh, incur extra costs here uh, regarding all these efforts. Do you have any idea of what those extra costs are and what is your funding source around any of this? Is there any place to go to get anything, any money? Yeah, I mean, the places are those that we still, that have always been there. In addition, we are pushing for the, the current stimulus package that is being discussed in Washington and it would, be, it would help uh, local governments and cities to offset some of the monies that schools have had to spend in order to deal with the pandemic. And so we are encouraging everyone to contact uh, our senators from Pennsylvania and advocate for the passing of that package that is in front of them or that they will be considering because that will go a long ways to providing additional revenue to us. It could be somewhere in the, in the, in the area of about $425 million in one-time funding. That would be very helpful and offsetting some of the expenses related to the pandemic. I'm sorry, but do you have any even a ballpark yet as to what your extra costs are as you try to uh, get kids back? Yeah, no, we, we are, we, we're estimating that, Jeff, and we're getting that information out. We know what we've lost ballpark in terms of last, this fiscal year. We know what some of the extra costs will be in terms of additional cleaners, additional supplies and resources but do not have a ballpark figure yet. All right, very Thank good. You. Thank you, Jeff. Let's go now to Chad Predelli of 6ABC. Yeah, uh, this is for the health commissioner. So I just wanna clarify that Delaware has been added or rec as a recommendation to self quarantine. If you're coming from Delaware to the city, when did that go into effect? When did you add that uh, state to your list? And what does that mean for people who live in Delaware and work in the city? So, you know, we, we set a, uh, a numeric threshold for uh, the states that we consider to be high incidence. And, and I was just notified yesterday that now Delaware has made that. I'm not sure if we've updated that on the website yet. Uh, so we, we recognize that there are practical concerns about that, practical issues around that. So we're going to look at that um, at the moment. Um, I, I'm not recommending that people who are commuters uh, from Delaware um, go into uh, quarantine for 14 days, uh, but I do recommend that we people be concerned about traveling high incidence areas within Delaware, and uh, we'll, we'll look and see what uh, whether we need to make our recommendations, need to modify our recommendations in view of the practical issues here. So you, all right. So you are asking them if they're commuters to quarantine, or you, or not? No, we're not recommending that right now. Okay, for the commuters. Correct. For anyone, though. You know, for, we are uh, still have a recommendation that are people who travel from high incidence areas. Again, for, that includes states like Florida and Texas, where they have very, very high rates. Um, the the uh, Delaware has newly met our threshold. Um, I'm just realizing as of today that uh, this is going to cause some practical issues for commuters. And so at the moment, I'm not recommending that for commuters. And we'll look at our uh, whether we need to change our recommendations in view of that. Thank you so much. 
Very good. Thank you, Chad. We'll go now to Sean Walsh of the Inquirer. Thanks very much. Um, Dr. Farley, uh, there seems to be growing agreement that the coronavirus may spread more widely than was previously thought through the air. Um, how might this change the city's recommendations for, uh, you know, all your guidelines, but especially for indoor gatherings and school? Yeah, you know, I've asked our experts what implications that would have. Um, first, I should say that the, uh, the feeling amongst our experts is if it travels to the air, uh, it's not the, the most common way that it is spread. If this were really uh, traveling widely through the air, as some other viruses do, and we would see cases, for example, where the uh, infected person was in one room and the person who became infected was in another room, and they never really had any face-to-face -face contact. We don't see so much of that. Uh, so if it occurs, it's not very often. Uh, and the, the feeling of our experts is that it wouldn't really change our recommendations for uh, how we operate the, the various businesses and activities that we allow to operate under our modified uh, green phase. Uh, that if it were widely accepted that uh, airborne transmission occurs, it might change what is done within hospitals. Uh, and it would be difficult to, to deal with that in hospitals because there are special rooms for uh, handling a person who has an infection that is spread through the air. And there are only so many of those. Uh, so it may be more practical, uh, have more practical implications there, but it probably would not change our recommendations outside of medical settings. Got it. Thanks very much. Um, and then, Brian, could you give us an update on um, the city's efforts to acquire PPE and also on the quarantine space uh, leased by the city? Uh, so when you talk about uh, efforts to acquire PPE, um, do you have a specific, um, specific um, question or just kind of effort, general efforts? Have any of the, uh, there, there was a large order that the city was waiting on coming from overseas. Has that come in or have other um, possibilities popped up in the meantime? So if I, if I recall the order you're, you're referencing, which was, it's been several weeks. Uh, so we did end up canceling an order that was uh, to be shipped from China, uh, which were N95 masks. We are pursuing uh, other shipments of N95 masks uh, into the city. Um, I think we have uh, uh, have a good supply of surgical masks uh, at this point, and uh, the uh, surgical gowns don't seem to be as much of a uh, as much of a pain point at this point. And then, uh, also, if uh, what is the occupancy of the various uh, quarantine spaces that the city? Sure. Uh, so our occupancy at. Uh, at the COVID prevention site, uh, which is on uh, 12th Street, is nearly full. Um, those are individuals who uh, had come out of congregate care facilities um, and uh, we're currently pursuing additional space uh, for that activity. Uh, I believe, I have to use specific numbers on, uh, on the quarantine and isolation space. Uh, I believe it is around 50% uh, occupied, but uh, we'll, we'll confirm and we'll get you those numbers back. Thanks very much. That's all I have. Sorry, Sean, can I go back on the, the PPE just to clarify one point? You know, sure. for in the hospitals in the city, for the most part, purchase their PPE directly through manufacturers. It's not coming through the city. Um, and I spoke to the chief medical officers on this last week. And all the hospitals at the moment are very well stocked as far as their uh, N95 masks. Uh, that was not the situation earlier in the epidemic. Uh, and so right now, if anything, they're trying to stockpile in case we get a second wave. At the moment, they're, they're doing fine. Got it. Thank you. All right, very good. Thank you, Sean. We'll go now to Manny Smith of CBS3. Uh, my first question is for the uh, school superintendent and for the uh, health commissioner. Just want to confirm that I think after sixth grade in Philadelphia, there is no school bus transportation. All of those students get uh, trans passes to ride SEPTA. So just want to double check that in the return to work for the fall or return to school for the fall, you guys are absolutely confident that we're going to have thousands of unsupervised children riding public transit on a daily basis, interacting with adults in the city and not expecting a health outcome with that activity. Well, you are correct, uh, Manny, that 7th through 12th grade in, in city of Philadelphia, public schools, school district schools, charter schools, the Archdiocesan schools, all of those children in seventh through 12th grade take public transportation. 
Uh, that is why SEPTA is very active. They have active membership in our work groups and we have transportation as one of those large work groups. And so we're working through what those details would be. Um, but our plan will not likely have all children traveling on the same days. Uh, we may have to break students up into various groups, uh, but those who will be in those grade levels would be traveling on SEPTA. You are correct. They, they're, they, all of those students would need to be wearing masks. So, I mean, do, do you know roughly how many students that would be? And again, from you and the health commissioner, are you, with them being unsupervised, going to and from twice a day, even if it's limited during the week, is there no concern for, you know, parents and the general public with that many students in a confined space of a bus or a train every day? Yeah, I mean, they will be unsupervised. And, and so just like they've been in the past, and it is, and we are working with SEPTA to look at what those protocols may be. And not just looking at SEPTA, not just talking with SEPTA, but also talking to the commissioner and to his staff members about the best approach for children taking public transportation. Got you. I don't know if the commissioner wanted to respond to that. Uh, again, I think you need to wait until we see the full plan, but uh, certainly uh, any children that are traveling on SEPTA, just like any adults traveling on SEPTA, are going to have to wear masks. Uh, and we want to limit the number of people in a particular car uh, as a way to reduce the risk of transmission. And my last question is for the commissioner and the uh, mayor. Uh, we covered an incident in Old City where a gun was pulled over the weekend. Uh, some parties in that situation said, hey, that had to do with... Uh, an incident over social distancing. Uh, you guys may remember the uh, incident at DuBruno Brothers a couple of weeks ago with someone spitting. Again, we've been seeing an escalating number of confrontations over health. Um, obviously, it's something top of mind for many of the residents of the city. Is there advice for how we kind of navigate through these very real fears and tensions among citizens? Hawk, you want to start? Uh, let me just say, you know, I, I don't know that, that necessarily these are escalating. I think that these kind of sort of uh, arguments happen and confrontations happen. Uh, in general, uh, the majority of people are wearing masks. Uh, that number we hope is increasing and we think it can increase. Uh, it's going to take some time for people to adjust to it. So you may see some incidents like that. Uh, I think we can get there through a combination of the policies we're making and the encouragement we're making. Um, and, and, you know, individual confrontations are going to have to be dealt with as they always are. My argument would be be uh, be thoughtful, be unselfish, uh, be kind to each other uh, and help us get some gun control in this country so that people don't resort to pulling a gun on somebody in an argument. All right. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Manny. We'll go now to Hannah Chin of WHYY. All right. Um, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Great. Um, so you mentioned, I think this question is for... Hi, I was wondering if there's a concern about children transmitting the virus to others in their household. Commissioner Tom Farley, I know you mentioned that you were encouraging people in more vulnerable popula populations to kind of be aware of who's entering and leaving their household. Is that also a concern for children? Dr. Farley, you want to say? Yeah, I mean, that is a concern for children. If children, um, if we have evidence of their being spread in a, in a school uh, or children are likely to get infected, they could bring it back to uh, people at home. And if you have elderly people or people who are medically vulnerable at home, that's a risk. Uh, so uh, we're doing everything we can to communicate to the vulnerable people in those households that they need to take precautions within those households. Uh, that's uh, simply that's not a risk that we can eliminate, but it's a risk we can reduce as much as possible. And for Dr. Hyatt, is that something that you're also thinking about on the school yes. end? Yes. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about how you would do that? Yeah, Hannah, I mean, I think that this is a, a very important issue for us, and that's why we're working with multiple groups, uh, not just uh, the health commissioner and his team, but also with the Children's Hospital and others, and really thinking about how we can capture information about the, not just the child, but things that, are, that may be happening in the child's home that would then in, in, increase the likelihood of, a, of the spread of the virus. And so some form of contact tracing, not necessarily contact tracing, but understanding and continuously questioning 
young people. We're doing that right now with individuals who come into work, although they are adults, about um, if in the individuals have been sick or have a high fever and they have to make sure they're complete in the form. We're gonna be doing very much of the same thing when schools start and we'll have protocols around that. In terms of surveying children who come in, et cetera. Yes. Okay, thank you. And are you all set? Yeah, I'm good to go. Very good. We'll go now to Martin Pratt of Philly YBN. Yes, uh, Dr. Haidt, uh, you mentioned earlier that there was uh, going to be a plan that you shared uh, regarding the buildings. Will that, will you roll that into your current town hall series or will that be something that is a separate meeting? I think one of the town halls is around facilities and environments. And so we'll talk about the types of protocols that are being done. Uh, the town halls are content-based. So one is on health and safety, one is on instruction, digital learning, one is on transportation, another one is on wraparound services, and one is on facilities and environment. And so, yes, one of the town halls will be based on the, the facilities and environmental issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brian, the, the, uh, I was trying to find out whether or not the Office of Violence Prevention was uh, budget was cut in the last round, or was re or the budget was uh, restored. So a portion of the Office of Violence Prevention uh, was cut. Uh, so we made adjustments to the Youth Violence Reduction Program, uh, which uh, many of those funds were then redirected to the uh, Group Violence Initiative, <clears throat> and the uh, community targeted uh, grants uh, was also cut by about five hundred thousand. Uh, we're thank looking you. for other sources to, to fill that gap. Okay, thank you. Yep. Aren't you all set? Yes. Very good. We'll go to Kennedy Rose of the Philadelphia Business Journal. Hi, I have two questions for Dr. Farley. My first one is, what are case numbers and trends telling you? And are we getting further away from reopening the final businesses that remain closed uh, as compared to, say, a few weeks ago? Well, you know, our case numbers are showing that we are uh, not decreasing, not increasing in the last week or so. Uh, now, before that, we had been decreasing. So the fact that we are no longer decreasing is not a good sign. <laughs> On the other hand, we're not increasing like the areas around us or, or increasing rapidly like the southern parts. Uh, I think in view of the increases all around us that we need to be very cautious right now. I wouldn't necessarily say that we're farther away, but I certainly I'm in no hurry uh, to open up uh, restaurants for indoor dining, which appear to be an important site for transmission elsewhere. Okay, and have your benchmarks for reopening indoor dining at restaurants or those other businesses with indoor sort of congregate settings, have those benchmarks changed in recent weeks? Uh, we haven't updated our, our uh, targets for that. I think we need to, to rethink that. Uh, in really, what, what's uh, we're, we haven't met those targets for one thing, and I'm not sure that whether we need to meet those targets and in open indoor dining. I think that the larger context is concerning me as much as uh, the fact that we haven't met those targets. That is to seeing increases everywhere else where they have reopened. Uh, and, uh, and I think, again, the, it's the particular concern we have about indoor dining where people uh, are getting close together and they're not wearing masks because they can't wear a mask while you're eating, uh, that that setting is particularly risky. Okay, that's all I had. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kennedy. Let's go now to our Hennies Figueroa of Univision. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I will in translation, please, Armando. Are you there? Buenas tardes, Argenis. Okay. Buenas tardes, Armando. Gracias. Gracias, Armando. Mi única pregunta va a ser para el doctor Farley. Y ah, que aprovecho para saludar también al alcalde. Um, basado en la tabla de la Texas Medical Association eh, y sus recomendaciones para las actividades versus riesgos de contagios de coronavirus, ¿Cuál sería el mensaje del Departamento de Salud de Filadelfia para disfrutar este verano? My question is for Dr. Farley with my greetings to the mayor. My question has to deal with the chart that's been issued by the Texas Medical Association in regards to activities and the degree of risk. And my question is, what is the message that the city has for the people in regards to this chart for safe activities? Uh, I have not seen the chart. Uh, I would simply say that uh, we consider activities that are indoors to be uh, more risky than those that are outdoors. We consider activities where people uh, are wearing masks to be at greater risk than where they're, uh, I'm sorry, where they're not wearing masks to be greater risk than if they're wearing masks. 
and then the larger number of people, it'd be greater risk than a smaller number of people. And uh, people are close to each other, greater risk than those uh, if their people are more spaced out. And so we use those sorts of uh, criteria in determining what activities we are more concerned about and more hesitant to allow to restart. No he visto esa tabla todavía de la Asociación Médica de Texas, pero nosotros consideramos que hay ciertas actividades que son menos peligrosas que otras. Por ejemplo, tenemos en cuenta de que las actividades al aire libre son menos peligrosas que las actividades en espacios cerrados. Obviamente, cuando se están utilizando las mascarillas, es más seguro que cuando no se están utilizando. También cuando hay grupos pequeños que se congregan, en contraste con los grupos grandes que pueden esparcir el riesgo. Cuando la gente no está pudiendo mantener la distancia social, es obviamente más peligroso que cuando la gente puede mantener su distancia. Y esos son algunos de los criterios que nosotros estamos observando para recomendarle a la gente. Ok, muchas gracias, Armando. Es todo. Gracias. Adiós, Argenis. Thank you very much. Ok, thank you, Argenis. Uh, we'll now to Dania Henninger of Billy Pan. Hello, just one question for Dr. Farley. Is there a target turnaround time for test results at the city run site or the, you know, the city health department sites? Uh, well, you know, the, the greatest delay in turnaround really depends on what laboratory it's sent to. Uh, so that uh, those that are sent to our laboratory and the hospital laboratories may have a turnaround of 24 hours or so. And those that are going to the national laboratories more like 48 hours and sometimes longer. Uh, the shorter, the better. We would love to have less than 24 hours because then that helps us to do contact tracing sooner. And, and some, I'm asking because some readers have been telling us that their results are taking a week or longer and then, you know, uh, that's stop gumming up other plans and things for work or other, other types of things. Is there a way to tell which lab it's going to or is there anything they can do? You know, we can look at our statistics. I have not heard of uh, uh, taking that long to have uh, test results. Now, I have heard that they, some of the national laboratories were uh, bottlenecked because of the huge demand uh, from uh, the southern states uh, and the western states. Uh, so maybe there's some that has happened recently that I'm not aware of, but our average turnaround in, in, for the national labs in the past has been one to two days. Uh, so it would be very unusual to have that many. And certainly seven days is far too long for what uh, it ought to be. Okay, thank you. All right, you're all set, Danya. Very good. Um, and this is the last call for questions. Uh, seeing no further questions, we'd like to again thank Dr. William Height, Superintendent of the Philadelphia School District. And of course, stay tuned for further announcements from the school district regarding the uh, coming school year. For now, that concludes today's daily briefing. We will resume again at 1 p.m. on Thursday.